I will arise and go now, and go to Innis Free, and a small cabin build there, of clay and wattles made. Nine bean rows will I have there, a hive for the honey bee, and live alone in the bee loud glade. And I shall have some peace there, for peace comes dropping slow, dropping from the veils of the morning to where the cricket sings. There midnight's all a glimmer, and noon a purple glow, and evening full of the linnet's wings. I will arise and go now, for always night and day I hear lake water lapping with low sounds by the shore, while I stand on the roadway or on the pavement's grey, I hear it in the deep heart's core. So Jonathan Yeats's Lake Isles of Innisfree, famous poem, we all read it as a child, we know it so well. Um, can you tell the learners something about the circumstances of the composition of that wonderful poem? Yeah, this is one of W.B. Yeats's early poems, the, 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 the great, probably the greatest of all Irish poets, born in 1865, lived, lived on till, till 1939. Um, the, uh, this was the first poem he really felt that he found his own voice. It was written when he was uh, living in London in the late 1880s and he was walking down the Strand, busy shopping street in London, uh, the, the bustle of urban life, and he saw in a shop window a sort of advertisement that took the form of a little fountain um, in which a ball was balanced on the top of the jet of water and, uh, and that he heard the sound of the water and it suddenly made him think of running water and it made him think back to Sligo in County Galway, back to his own roots, back to the place where he was happy as a child. And he remembered how he had often dreamed as a young man that he would go to a deserted island called Innis Free, uh, which is on the middle of one of the lochs in near Sligo. Um, and he had imagined that he might live there as he put it, in imitation of Thoreau. What he was thinking of there was a famous book by Henry David Thoreau, the great American writer, who went to live a simple and thoughtful life in the woods at Walden, um, just outside Boston. Um, and so the poem is about that idea of being in the city, a uh, time of busyness, a time of stress, but an image reminding him of this safe place, this happy place, this place where he might have lived a life of peace, a life at one with nature in the manner of Thoreau. It's extraordinary because I think poetry is almost unique in being able to transport you into a different place. In fact, he's in London, he hears the running water, he's suddenly back in Ireland. And I think one of the things we're interested in is, is that idea of um, when someone's feeling stressed or unhappy, that an image can take you away from your troubles. You talked about a happy place. Mm. Um, and I th do you feel that there's something in that, th that's peculiar to poetry actually, that you, there's something about the containment of, of the words and the images that you feel that you can be transported to another place? Well, you can, I mean, I, I don't know how, whether it's exclusive to poetry, because of course there's a sense in which um, a painting um, can achieve that. Although the thing about the painting is you, you, you physically need it there. It has, and it, it, it's, its visual cues, its visual cues are very specific. The thing about a poem, especially a short poem like this, which you can very easily commit to memory, um, it, is that it, um, you don't physically have to, to have it with you. It's there in your imagination. And there's a way in which you can substitute your own images, your own visual cues um, for, for Yeats's. You don't have to know precisely what the real Lake Isle of Innisfree looks like. Um, you don't specifically have to know um, what a linnet, a, a bird he mentions in the poem, looks like. Um, you can substitute your own bird, you can imagine your own beehives. And I think that is the wonderful thing about a poem, is that you as a reader can take possession of it. When Yeats died in 1939, his fellow poet W. H. Auden wrote a wonderful poem on his death and, uh, in memory of Yeats. And he, he says in that poem that the, um, the words of the poet um, are given over to the reader. He became his admirers 
is Auden's line. He became his admirers. He, Yeats, is dead, but his words belong to and come back to life as his admirers read and recite his poems. And as you were reading the poem, um, I just felt myself slowing down. There's something about the tempo. You almost can't read it quickly. It sort of forces you to read it very slowly, which I found incredibly relaxing and, and de-stressing. What is it about, what is he doing technically that makes us feel that we're slowing down? Yeah, I, th I think it's, it, it's three things really. It's the rhythm, the rhyme and the images. The regularity of the rhythm forces you to slow down. Um, and then the, the rhyme means that you, you're, when you hit the rhyme word, you're always looking back to the previous rhyme word. You can't rush forward. But then also the imagery that he's, he's feeding you all these words associated with natural calm, with natural ease. Words to do with quietness, to do with calm um, and transporting you with him. Um, it's, uh, it, it's a particularly, particularly powerful poem, I, I, I think, um, in that regard. Um, and uh, it's interesting also that he, it, its voice uh, in some ways is quite conversational. He, he said when describing this poem, it was the first poem where he thought that he was beginning to loosen his language, loosen his rhythm and his rhetoric. When Yeats began writing, um, a, the prevalent Victorian poetry um, was a little bit grandiose in style and he's gradually sort of simplifying his style. Having said that, of course, the, the question of the pace at which you read it, whether it does, whether you do speed up or slow down, that's very variable. That's one of the lovely things about poems is that you can read them at different paces and in different ways. So we've um, got an exercise uh, that uh, our, our, our learners uh, might like to, to, to undertake. Um, we've got um, some links to different readings of the same poem. And indeed one of them is by Yeats himself, uh, a very, very old crackly reading of Yeats as an old man. And he reads it in an astonishing sort of incantatory voice, like a, like a magician weaving a spell. Uh, it sounds terribly old fashioned. But then uh, there are other readings of it. There's lots and lots of versions of this have been recorded. You could... Uh, There's a wonderfully Anthony Hopkins uh, Anthony uh, Hopkins, uh, the, 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 um, the, the great actor. I think he reads, reads it too quickly. Well, I think that's the point, isn't it? That uh, uh, you, you really can read it at different speeds. Um, and uh, it, it, it's, a, it's a nice exercise, uh, maybe to uh, even, you know, to, to get the second hand of your watch out and, uh, yeah. uh, and just see how long it takes to read from beginning to end. I think I, I read it uh, a little bit more slowly than, than both Hopkins and Yeats. I like the incantationary quality of the Yeats. Just a couple of t tiny things. Um, we're quite interested in this idea of uh, starting from that image of poems on the underground that in the chaos, in the busyness of, of life, you, you, the, you read a poem and you're transported, you're calm. But I was also thinking a bit as you were talking about Yeats being in London and then writing the poem about Ireland. I was thinking about how Chinese poetry often, you know, that, that, that cont contention between the court, the intrigue of the court and the city, and then going out to the countryside and calm. It just, there was something about the way you were talking about that reminded me of that great yeah. ancient tradition. Well, it's a great uh, tradition in uh, as a Chinese poetry, that the, the classic Chinese poetry of the, the Tang dynasty is often uh, written by these court officials who get terribly caught up in intrigue at court. Um, and then they head off to the, to the mountains or a lake or a, a, a bamboo grove and find a kind of peace. Um, and that's in uh, Western classical poetry as well. The great Roman poet Horace, uh, a lot of his poems are again about uh, intrigue in the world of politics and business and commerce. And then he retreats to a, a rural farm. It's a theme throughout literature, the sense that um, poetry can help transport you to a calmer world, a greener world, um, a place of ease.